Welcome to the Minimalist CEO Podcast with Nate Lindquist. Nate created the Minimalist CEO Method to help business owners redefine and grow their businesses by finding new demand in places they never thought to look where there's no competition. By following his opposite thinking strategy, Nate's coaching clients have grown their business up to 40% in just two months and created tens of millions of dollars in revenue. Nate himself has launched more than 140 businesses. On the show, Nate interviews successful business owners and experts who share the secrets you can use to have a better business and a better life. Hey everyone, this is Nate Linquist here with the Minimalist CEO Podcast. I'm glad to have you here. You picked this episode for a reason, so I'm going to give you the absolute best that we can. The goal here with Minimalist CEO, as always, is to tease out those little moments of truth where the, the, the people who we're interviewing are stripping away something, stopping something, focusing on essential to build their helping system, to grow their business by helping more people and share their gifts. And I am really excited to introduce to you our guest for today. Uh, before I, I tell you who he is, and uh, maybe you're watching the video, so you can see him already. Like, just tell me who he is. So um, this is a guy who is a real estate broker. He is a licensed real estate broker, real estate agent, probably the right term, uh, construction company owner and author. And he's got, his, he's got his fingers into lots of other different businesses as well, but this is an innovator. So we have an opportunity here to learn from uh, our guest today, who's done a lot in this business, Mike Levan. Thanks for being on the show, Mike. It's good to have you here. No, thank you for having me. I truly appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm pumped to have you here as well. And I think it's cool. Um, you've, you've really captured different aspects and layers of the real estate market. You've become an advisor. You're an investor. Um, tell us about yourself and how you got started in your construction business and how you got started in real estate and kind of what's the, what's the process that got you to this point? So I actually began um, being a real estate agent about five years ago in 2015. Um, just off the whim, like I used to work in a correctional field for juveniles and the job was cool, but it wasn't really like satisfying me. I like to be free out and about. I like to have the freedom of like making my own schedule, not having to ask for vacation time and stuff like that. So I jumped into real estate. Um, I hit the ground running from in that business as far as being, you know, one of the top agents in my local area. And then from there, you know, had a little bit of money to play with. So I started investing you know, buying houses, fixing and flipping them and rehabbing them and stuff like that. So once I pretty much got into the investing field, I realized like, you know what, I can actually create my own contracting company. You know, the guys I had working for me were great contractors. They needed some leadership. You know, I needed them. So we just joined forces to say, listen, guys, you know, I'll start the business up if you guys mind working for me. And then from there, I became a local contractor. So I found myself, put myself in positions where, I was around people all day for being a realtor who were dealing with buying houses or selling houses or even other investors I worked with as far as fixing and rehabbing houses. So I wanted to offer them the opportunity to, hey, I could be your realtor and also your contractor. So, so you got into real estate from being in the correctional space? And you said well, no, I, I worked in corrections before that. But then, like I said, what I realized with that kind of job was I didn't like being tied down to people telling me what to do all day. You right. Know? When I look back, though, and it just I want to dig a little deeper there. So and I know a lot of our listeners already have businesses and have already made that leap. But you you recognize I see a pattern here and I, I see it a lot on the show is you see an opportunity. Yes. You create a change. So you don't like the limitation on your freedom. You you actually said the job was cool, but you want to be able to make your own hours. You want to be able to make your own way. So real quick, if you could just shine a light on what, what, what was the moment? Like, when did it happen when you said, uh, that's it, I'm done at a job and I'm going into real estate. Did you just quit, just quit your day job and off I go. How'd you burn that bridge? No. So how it actually happened was, um, I got injured on the job to where I was out of work for a little bit, but in that kind of field, you, uh, you get used to making a lot of the overtime money. Like you budget your lifestyle around overtime money. So when you're not getting the overtime money, you're getting regular pay. You feel like as if like you're not making enough money. So for the holiday season, when I'm getting like a second job, 
Um, at, there's a premium aloe out here called Woodbury Commons. So I wanted getting a second job at a watch store. Right. So, them, uh, it again, kind of muddied up a little. There was a what? A Christmas time and what? There was no, a it's a it's a it's a premium outlet out here called Woodbury Commons. So I wound up getting a second job at a, a watch store. And long story short, I remember telling the manager, like, listen, um, you know, I don't want to do any sales. I just I just want to pretty much be in the back stock room, throwing boxes around all day. I'm not good with people, yada, yada, yada. She looked at no problem. So then one day the store got seriously busy. Mike, do you mind helping me on the floor? I need some help with the sales. Uh, okay. I go to the floor where I'm selling like five watches. So I realized I had a niche for just talking to people, helping people, and making them convince them to buy something that they, they, might not, they may not want. You know, so long story short, my mom was like, listen, if you like it, get into real estate. It's the biggest sales market on there. Okay. I went to real estate office, sat down with the, with the manager, who is currently my manager still. She said, listen, off of commission, you can make this amount of money. And when I saw that, I'm like, well, I can make this amount of money by selling one house. That took me about two weeks, 80 hours of time to make in my other job. And at that point, the other job was like, I said it was cool, but it was a lot of stress. You know, corrections, it's a stressful field, uh, being in a negative environment all day and stuff like that. So after a while, I got into real estate, so myself, you know, increased my business. But when I went back to my job full time as the corrections, I was losing a lot of opportunity because like, you don't have your phone. You're locked in a building all day, sometimes 16 hours a day. So I said, I have to make a decision. Either I'm going to stick with what I know and I'm not really happy with because it can be stressful and the timing and the controlling of it, or I can take a chance of my, you know, my own personal belief in myself and belief in my hustle and try real estate out. And one thing about me is once I lock into something, I know I'm going to be okay with it. It may take a little bit of time, but once I figure out the business of it, I'm going to succeed at it. So I did that. I went into real estate full time. And the good thing about my old job is they can hold your position for a year. So if it doesn't work out, you can always come back to them a year later. So I told myself, I'm going to give myself a year. If I can increase my real estate business in a year, I don't need to ever go back there. And that's what I did. I told them, listen, I'm going to resign for right now. I went into real estate full time. I put all effort and time into it, and it turned out to be very successful for me. Mm -hmm. So, one thing that's important, I think, for the listeners, for everyone to notice that you just said is that you said once I lock into something, I know I'll be okay. Yep. Yep. And and then you gave yourself a target. You said I'm going to go all in, 100, percent and I'm going to give myself a deadline of one year to make it work. So you share that. How does that apply to how you get started in doing investing in the construction business? Because now you get this transition that you made. How did that come together and how did you lock into that? It's the same thing. You know, I feel like as if, you know, anytime you have <clears throat> pieces of a puzzle you can put together, you can build a masterpiece. So, okay, I knew the real estate side. I knew how the market was at the time because I was a real estate agent. Um you know, creativity wise, I'm not going to like, I'm not the best person as far as designing a home. So I found people that could do it. My wife, she's great at picking out stuff and, you know, these tiles go with these cabinets, with these countertops, you know, this paint color, yada, yada, yada. So I was asking for her opinions. Hey, I'll find the property that makes sense in an area I know we can profit on. You design it and make it nice. You know, so I had the real estate side of it covered, which is myself. The design side covered it, which was, you know, by her a lot of the times. And then I had to find the contractors. So from there, don't get me wrong, I went through a couple of contractors who weren't really the best um, good people, but it wasn't really professional wise to where I found the crew I have now. So I said, OK, well, you guys can do the work. I can find, buy and sell the property. She can design it. What else is there? <laughs> so once I put all that together and I was focused on it and dedicated to it, once again, there was no reason why I should fail. So uh, one thing I think that uh, could easily be overlooked in all this is you went from an income in a job just over broke, right? A job, yeah. On the overtime, you're busting your butt. Then you jump into real estate, so you're starting to see more financial opportunity. But then you started investing. You said, you know, and, I, and so from my experience in building businesses for it'll be 29 years. I'm uh, sorry, 30 years. It's 29 years now. 30 years in March. By, by the time we hit March, I know in every deal in business. To make it happen, you talk about the puzzle pieces. There's always the person with the deal, 
that sees the puzzle and says, you put this in, this could be really great and can forecast money coming in. Right. And it's going to work. Then, so there's the person with the deal. There's the person with the money who says, hey, I'll fund that because I believe in that vision. I believe when that puzzle comes together, that, that is going to happen. And I believe you, you show me enough information. Maybe in the, in the investment space, we call that an investor's forecast or investor's path. Yeah. And then the other piece is, hey, I, I could build that. Like I'll put the pieces together for you. I'll manage it and build it and I'll do the, I'll create. So there's the creator and builder and the doer, right? Mm-hmm. Guys on the site, contractors. But in every project that there's always the money person and then there's the person with the deal who understands like this could really work. And I tell people who don't have the money, pick one of those roles that you're most suited for and prepared for today and then do what you can, where you are with what you have. Yeah. Get to, you know, maybe you're crossing the river into being an investor, but you got to get to that first stepping stone. Go find the deal. If you don't have the money, go find the deal. If you're really good at contracting, find someone who has the deal and, and already has the money. But, but I think, I think though, in my opinion, I always tell people is that's the first stepping stone to getting actually physically involved in it. But the first stepping stone to really get mentally involved in it, make the decision. Is that the you law? Know, I, huh? You're, maybe you're, you have a book already. Maybe your next book needs to be locked. locked <laughs> yeah. Into- yeah, because I feel like as if like it's making the sense. I, I, I come across a lot of people now, um, the more that I've done in this business. And, you know, people reach out to me and want to hmm. build and connect. I have no problem with that. But a lot of times people don't understand, it's, you know, how serious this game is. Um, they see what's going on on TV and stuff like that. I think it's very easy and simple. But when it comes down to it, you know, you have to really mentally make the decision that you want to do this. You know, you want to be able to put the time and energy into it because if you're not, then it won't work out. Mm-hmm. So I think the first first step is mentally making a decision that you want to get into it. And then once you get into it, you know, lock yourself in and, 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 and go full force until you until you close on the property. But if you don't have that, you know, 100 percent confidence mentally that you're ready to do it, you know, then don't don't even bother wasting your time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, have- yeah, it doesn't work. That's great advice. You know, Mike, um, I, I think about what you're saying, this idea of it's a serious game, it's a mental game first. Um, that's where the deal's made first, for sure. At what yeah. point for you, were you able to scrape together? Were you the deal guy? Were you the money guy? Were you the creator guy? What, did you play two of those roles? How did you break into it to get to that first stepping stone? Get to that I, was prob- I, was actually, um, I was actually all the above besides the contractor. You know, I partnered up with another guy, um, a friend of mine, on our first deal. You know, we went half and half on it, but property cash. And the thing about it, there was a property I purchased. I went, I'm showing it as a realtor to another investor who didn't want it. You know, he didn't want that property, but I saw potential in it when I saw it with him. I'm like, listen, I can see certain things that he's not seeing. So when he told me he didn't want it, um, I showed it to my partner at that time. I said, listen, I think we can make something work over here. You know? <clears throat> and I want to buy it myself for a great deal. So I put half the money up, um, designed it ourselves, and like I said, I hired a contractor, you know. And at that point in time, uh, being in the business, I was going up with referrals. So, like, my home inspector at that time referred me to the contractor, you know, because, like I said, I didn't know anything about it, but I knew people who knew stuff about it. So I used their resources. So I was actually two of those three people at that time. I was actually the realtor um, and the money guy. And like I said, I brought in, you know, my partner at that point. We designed it ourselves. The only thing we really needed was a contractor. And you, you also saw the deal. You're someone who you saw the whole puzzle and you saw what pieces need to be put together. And that's huge. A lot of people. Yeah. Don't know that. Um, okay. Well, I mean, so you got the deal and you did, you started investing. And one thing also that I've learned, tell me this is what you've noticed too. Uh, you've got the title companies that show up for the closing, mm-hmm. you got the fancy car, the fancy office, the fancy suit. Yeah. Realtor that shows up quite often with a fancy car and the fancy suit. But then when you're the one with the deal and you're the investor, you could show up in your pajamas and you're still getting the biggest check. Yeah. And that's the, that's the crazy thing about it, though, is when you so when you come to the clothing table and you are the investor and the realtor, you know, so when you're selling the property, you get two checks. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So when you're selling the property, you get two checks. You get the, the check as the investor made out to the business name and then you get the check as a realtor made out to your name. So it's it's a... It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Double down. That's good. I love that. So you, you saw opportunity again, and then you actually uh, created a construction company as doing this investment. And now you do construction 
for clients who are looking for construction projects to be done. Is that right? Exactly. So after a while, um, I found another contractor who's amazing. Um, the thing he lacked a little bit of knowledge and business sense. So when I told him I can do the business side of it, you know, I can pretty much, I told him in a nutshell, I can make you a lot of money. You know, if you want to follow my ways of going about things and, and, and work with me, I can make you a lot of money. So he was like, listen, he can do the work. I have the connections. I'll find you the work. And we built from there. Um, because being as a real estate agent, I'm around people all day who are around houses, obviously. So I might sell a person the property and they called me a week later and say, hey, Mike, you know anybody who can renovate my bathroom? Of course I do. So I send the crew over there. They give them a quote. Like I said, in a nutshell, I'm being their realtor and their contractor. And everybody's happy because we do great work. Um, we provide great service. And, you know, a client gets, gets a, a great motivation to their property. So when you talk about being the business side and this contractor, you know, we say that a lot. People that are the technician, they go out, they can do work great with their hands. They're great with a hammer and great with wood. So what do you think the key is uh, to making great money, to be able to say, hey, let's not make money, getting your business, you know, the money making side of the business. And how did you make that money? to where it is today in your business, where you actually grew your business to where it is today? The key is keeping a positive relationship with people. You know, the biggest marketing tool is word of mouth, word travel, especially like around the time we're in now with social media and stuff like that. People can either praise you or bash you very easily. Mm -hmm. So you want to build those positive relationships with your clients. Um, listen, is everybody always going to be happy? No. You know, but the thing is about it is how you approach it and how you deal with the situations at all at any given time. So I think the biggest thing is building a positive relationship. You know, give good customer service, stand by your word, be professional and prompt, give cranks and get and give great quality work, especially as a contractor. You know, I've seen um, shoddy work and, and and bad craftsmanship. And I'm just like, I don't know how people even show a house this way with the work that's done like this. And I've seen immaculate work. And my business model is I'd rather be on the immaculate side of things. So the best thing you can do is build a positive relationship. If something happens to go wrong, your client calls you, you know, be motivated and inspired to go address that issue the same way you were when you got the job, because that's what's going to keep your business going in the long run and also keep your business growing in revenue. Because if you fix somebody's kitchen one day and they're happy about it, they're going to want to show it off to the world. They're going to put it on social media. They're going to put it, you know what I mean, send pictures out to their personal friends and stuff like that. And then people are going to ask, wow, your kitchen looks beautiful. Who did it? I can refer HLV contractor. They did my house. Next thing you know, you're going to call from somebody else down the street. Hey, I saw you did John's bathroom at 123 Main Street. I want to do my bathroom at 456 Main Street. Can you come by and give me a quote? And that's how your business keeps growing and growing. Well, that's, that's great advice. That's great advice. I think that sometimes business owners want to complicate the idea of, how to be successful, how to make the money. And you're like, relationships, do a good job. Keep that relationship positive. So um, what are some of the challenges that you face? I mean, in, in getting your business to where it is right now, you've had a, you know, when, what year did you start building these different businesses? If you, 2015. I, okay. So you've moved pretty quickly. What are some of the challenges that you face working as a hands-on business owner, building businesses, you're, I mean, you're, some of these businesses are, you know, recently formed and just growing right now. Yeah. What are some of those challenges? What's been the difficult stuff that, you know, maybe you can give an example of what you had to get through. Yeah, honestly, I mean, listen, it's, it's great to be successful, but those failures are part of success. I, I've hit a lot of um, tough spots um, in learning. You know, that's the biggest thing is not getting, you know, mentally overwhelmed and stressed out because I know that I'm learning from it so that if I come across it again, I know how to deal with it and it work out. But the biggest challenge is having to go through those rough times, having to go through those, those situations where you're not experienced and you don't know how to deal with it and something goes wrong and you say, okay, you know what? I messed up. I still have to provide a good service. I may even lose money and time. But at least I know next time when I deal with this again, how to go about the right way. So the, the, the biggest thing I can tell people is when you're getting into any kind of form of business, you know, be prepared to go through those rough patches first because you're not going to be able to really get to where you want to get through unless you learn how to do it the best way possible. Yeah, and mistakes are, are lessons. You know, there's no failures. It's just all lessons. And I've, I've, I've been in a property, for example, where, you know, my personal investment, I fix and flip and 
three days before closing, I go check on the house and the back door is broken because somebody broke into the property, went downstairs and stole the, the, the copper piping, you know? So what I do, call a plumber up, get an emergency service call done, put new plumbing downstairs in the basement. Okay, next time we're going to try to do, you know, the, the, the flex piping if possible or situation with property I have now, actually. Um, I got a call from the realtor. Thank God that the buyer was there doing an inspected, inspection, excuse me, and the basement was flooded. You know, like, you know, how nerve wracking that could be. So I do. I don't take care of that. What do you learn? Like, you know, make sure your temperature is a certain, a certain place when you are heating a house through the winter so your pipes don't freeze. So it's all learning experiences that I, I've, I've learned from. But to be honest with you, I couldn't be more confident in doing the next project because I learned from the last one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's important, right? To look back. And did you have a time like once you started these businesses where you kind of had a holy crap moment? Like, is there one example where you, you, everything felt like, wow, it's really happening. It's really going. You started to see the prize, the gold at the end of the rainbow. I'm going to get my first deal or whatever it was. And then all of a sudden it was like, boom, everything was just like, I, I could be in real trouble right now. I, I don't know if I get through this. Yeah. So actually as a contractor, I did. So where I live at um, in Newburgh, New York, the inner city is, is up and coming. But with that, it's like a lot of, what's the word? It's like a lot of uh, changes happening. So when you're doing when you're doing renovations down in the in the city of in the, in the, in, the, in the inner city, they have a lot of rules and regulations, mm. a lot. Um, and I'm working on a property right now, a three family home for one of my clients, and the amount of stipulations they have is through the roof. You got to go, you know, get a permit for this, permit for that. Got to go in front of the meeting board for this, get approved for this. It's just a lot. I'm so used to just going in properties. You know, getting a permit, getting to work, completing it, everybody's happy. But with this particular one, it was a lot of things we had to do. So at first, we started rolling. Demo was complete. Framing was complete. Electrical started. Getting quotes. Everything was moving good. And then they put a stop order on us. And, you know, it went from such an emotional high because things were going good, everybody was happy, to now we're at a standstill for months because corona hit. You know, so once corona hit, um, there was pretty much no work allowed being done by contractors. Um, no, no building inspectors were coming out to do any kind of permits or anything like that. So we stood for about four or five months doing nothing in limbo. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, having to deal with, like I said, all this paperwork and different rules and regulations, it really set things back. It became mentally stressful for myself and the client. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you firsthand, like that was something where we were going in on cruise control at one point to literally wake up one day and told, listen, you can't even step foot in the building anymore until you go down to the building department and get all these paperwork and everything, documentation taken care of before we can start the work again. So you were down. Your, your again? project you said was down for months. Is that right? Yeah, because we had to stop because of Corona, because they weren't allowing um, contractors to work. Uh, I mean, your palms must have been sweating emotionally it's got to feel like whoa i got a family to take care of what do you mean i have to stop yeah and you know what it was though it, it it was that and it was also too many because like i said the biggest thing is the relationship the client that i had she's an amazing person and i really wanted to complete the project for her you know she had big plans and goals with this property so yeah. i was invested in it mentally and emotionally as much as she was i love that i love that you just shifted the entire focus on listen i have my goals but the customer really needed this done and i think of the like so when my crashed i think i told you as we're getting ready to start recording the podcast that i had a crash and mm -hmm. i crashed financially and when i when i had that mental switch and it was like over a six to six to eight hour period it, it was that moment where it was like listen instead of what can i get how can i fix my situation what am i gonna do with my finances i mean i was in real trouble when I made the switch to how may I serve, who's counting on me? What do they need? How are they feeling? Right. All of a sudden, all that, like, how can I help more? That's why I call what I do building helping systems when I work with clients as a mentor and do turnarounds and scale them. You know, when a company moves from, hey, I have an idea to doing their first 200,000, then they get up to their first million, then they get up to their first five or 10 million. You can see the transition from, I want to have a business that makes money to, I want to, have a business that helps more people. Yes. And man, you just did that. I didn't have to, I mean, clearly that is a, that's an ingredient. That's genius. 
it's it's God's gift to to the work that you're doing, the people you're working with, to be able to say, it's not about me. So it's I dig, done. I dig that, and it's I think about your your employees and your contractors, and they're think you're thinking like I got to serve this client. These guys, we got to find a way to make sure we get back on our feet so these guys can have their jobs and get paid. Mm-hmm. And I can honor my commitments. And then you said, oh, yeah. <laughs> then you probably thought about your, your family and your kids. You have kids? Yeah, two girls. Yeah, two girls, right. So you're thinking about, okay, I got to take care of them. And maybe, just maybe, some point over the next couple of days, once you figure out how you're going to triage and deal with those situations to really help the people counting on you, you may have had a thought like, <laughs> excuse me. God bless you. You may Thank have you. a thought like, how am I doing? <laughs> and, but maybe yeah. it's like, you're so busy focused on someone else and getting those, hitting those goals for them and understanding what they're going through. That's uh, that's some brilliant stuff. I'd love to ask you, could you share any tips or strategies on what it takes to run a successful construction business? You know, I work with lots of home service businesses, lots yeah. of them, but I find contractors are, they struggle, I think with this concept of, um, like daily to-do lists and constantly being inside the business. And I think it's easy to, you know, you can't read the label from inside the bottle. So giving, if you were to go out and give advice, which with your book and other things that you're doing where you're headed, I think you're a perfect candidate to give this advice. What would you tell other contractors about for tips and strategies to make their construction business even more successful? Well, first off, you got to have a crew that you trust. Um, a trustworthy crew is very important and who's loyal to you and dedicated. Uh, one thing I love about my crew is that um, I can, you know, have them handle things over a phone call. So if it's something where, listen, we're starting a new project today. We got to go buy materials for these clients. You know, I know they're not going to steal from me. Um, I'm, I'm extremely confident in that. If I, you know, tell them, listen, you know, we got to go buy this and that. And when you get there, call me, I'll put in my credit card. They're not sneaking in extra materials for their own personal use. You know, so you have to have a true that a crew that you trust. And also when you're in people's properties and their homes, you want to make sure that they actually give the same amount of service that you would give. So they're clean, you know, um, maintain the property where they want to. The, 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 the customer feels comfortable with having these strangers in their household. So trustworthy is a big thing. Number two is organization. You have to be organized in this business. Only because you're gonna come across time when you're dealing with you know, high-end number of renovations, $30,000, $40,000 labor costs, um, you want to make sure that everything adds up to where everybody's happy and making money because if you forget a cost or a certain number somewhere and you're not organizing what your materials or labor costs are going to be like, you may mess around and lose money. You may tell the clients when it costs you to cost them $30,000, but truth be told, there's so much work, it's going to actually cost $35,000, $40,000, and you can't come in after the fact and drop another 10000 because you messed up. You know, that's your mistake. How do you, so, how do you stay organized, Mike? Because there's so many details. I mean, are you working with, with notebooks? Are you working with ledger? Are you working with pen and paper? Do you have software that you're using? Um, I'm, I, I do. I do. Little, I honestly do a little, school, a little pen and paper, a little bit of uh, Excel. I to keep track of what my numbers are looking like. So what I usually do is if I give a quote to a property and we, you know, come to common terms, obviously, and the contract is drawn. From there, what I'll do is I'll put the numbers in an in, in, in Excel spreadsheet. And then I'll break down my numbers from there. I usually only do labor costs. In my opinion, it's easier. I don't like to include material costs because if, A, I quote you materials in August and we don't start the project until October, and then those certain materials are either gone up in price or no longer in stock, now we start all over again. And a certain person has a budget that's set and say, listen, well, the material is going to be $30,000, now it's going to be $40,000. That's 10 grand they may not have. So the project is screwed up. I like to only give labor costs. I'll tell the client, listen, you go pick out your materials. We'll meet you at, you know, whatever Home Depot or Lowe's. We'll pick up the material. What do you purchase it? You pay for it. We'll load it in the truck and then we'll go actually, you know, do the renovation. But I only like to do labor costs. It's just a lot easier for me, a lot easier for my guys. I think it's easier for a client also. You know, we they can't say we must quote them in labor, I mean, in material. You go out, you choose what kind of floor you want, what kind of countertops you want, what kind of cabinets you want, so on and so forth. And then we'll do all the labor as far as installing it. So it's easier on my numbers end of it because I say, listen, we're getting 40000 in labor. You know, I need, you know, 50% deposits. Now your balance is 20000 It breaks down my numbers a lot easier. 
And also, you know, in, in addition to that, do you find that that's a great way to create transparency so the client doesn't feel like maybe they're getting, you're getting yes. you're used on the materials. I mean, look at how many people have markup and margin on materials when <clears throat> the client doesn't know it or they're, they're, that's that trust thing. Is that right? Yeah, that's the biggest thing is the trust, you know, but I think it's a lot easier. I think it just makes them more comfortable. Um, I've seen clients say, listen, Mike, you know, I really didn't expect to spend this much of material. And I say, well, I understand it, but also, too, I want you to know from my experience, you know, you may be able to find something just as nice for less money, you know, and people need people need to know that because they're not experiencing it the way we are, you know, so I'll tell them other ways they can save money and cut back and still make a beautiful masterpiece. Yeah. Well, what you doing? Well, this is pretty good advice. So if uh, I got, I got to get back to the minimalist side of things, so I'm just going to say like we've got we've, we've got plenty of listeners who have small businesses, and they're doing too much themselves. So they get their first project, they're like, hey, I'm going to dive in and work in my business. Then they get their second project, and they get their tenth project. Then they have their you know they have thirty projects running, and what what advice would you give them and this is how i want you to give the advice i'm going to challenge you on this okay. One, uh what would you do to make sure you can delegate to other people so what's the first thing you do to make sure you can delegate effectively so you don't have to be on every job at every site at every home depot visit on every phone call right. the second piece is what are you gonna what are you gonna tell them to cut away to not do make sure you so I, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of in a business for their service or product or whatever your solution is, and I'll go back and restate it so I'm not going to have to write it down, is to add, remove, or enhance whatever you're doing regularly so you end up doing the work, offering the solution in a way where you're investing your time and energy and resources in the right stuff. You know, so what would, let's just say, what would you make sure to um, add? What would you enhance? And what would you not do? Uh, to to make sure, and then when I say add, to, how do, how are you going to move stuff off your plate so you can have more free time, so you can have more focus, so you can work on the business, and then answer that first, and we'll go to the next one. So All right. What, so wait, what was the first question? I'm sorry. What are you going to do to delegate? Let's start with delegate. So if you, oh, it's easy with, with delegate, and I think honestly, it comes down to I like to personally involve people in my circle because that trust factor is already there. Mm -hmm. So like I said. I'm not good at designing. I'm not good at, at home staging. So let me find somebody who does. My wife enjoys shopping and stuff like that. So then I'll have her do it. You know what I mean? Or when my friends do it. So like a lot of times when I come down to delegating certain things, it, I start with who do I know that can help me that I can trust to get it done the right way and the most honorable way. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah, because it, it's, and also it saves you. Because outside companies are going to charge you, you know, what they want, which I understand it's business. But if you find somebody that's going to, that wants to see you win and succeed, you still compensate them for their time and energy. But you get two things. You get great work for a great price. And also, too, you're putting money in someone's pocket that you actually want to help out. I'd rather help a friend than a stranger. So let me find somebody that's close to me that can do it, and we can all be happy and, and win at the same time. So this is the uh, the all boats the guide approach that says, listen, we're going to go in there, understand, like, I, I want to make sure you win really big. Mm -hmm. For you to win really big, the client needs to win and the company needs to win. So you understand that and you know what you're not good at and what, what you're good at. You're going to focus on what you're good at. Do you find yourself holding on to work or doing things sometimes just to save money or because like, oh, things are a little tight or to save some time? Or maybe you just don't have the person where you take on some things that's not really your specialty or your gift at the moment. Um, yeah, I think we all do, though. Yeah. You know, and, and I have because, A, maybe it's something where I couldn't find anybody to do it. I'm like, ah, I don't want to spend a lot of money to do it, so I'll figure it out myself. I've done that before, and it, it doesn't work out because, like I said, you're not given the best quality if you're not able to do it the best way. Yeah. So times with me, I'll – I'll try my best, but if I see a result, it's not the way that I would like it in my own personal project. I'll see, you know what? I can't, I can't leave it like this. Yeah. And so I've done it before. It's going to cost you more to take it on yourself. Yeah. I tried not to because a lot of times it, 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 it doesn't come out the best way. And then, like I said, reputation speaks for itself. So if somebody, if you don't like it, 
you got to probably expect that your client won't like it either. Okay. The second question, what, what would you tell uh, someone in, let's just specifically look at construction. I think anyone in business could learn from it anyways. What are you going to tell them to delete? Stop doing this. Don't do this. Cut this away so that they can focus on what's essential. Stop doing favors. Okay. Stop doing favors. You know, don't, don't cut yourself short. Um, people want to get top quality work. So, you know, you're going to give them top quality work. So don't be afraid to get top quality pay for your work. People so want to skill. Hey, just for lots of companies, I noticed that they're like, I'm only getting eight or 10% on my job in construction. What did you say to someone who's, who's pricing their jobs? Cause they really, maybe they're chasing the dragon. Maybe they lost some money on a last, yeah. oh, I gotta get this job. And they, they cut their margin down to eight to 10%. What would you say to that person? Um, you know, you actually, hurt, you actually hurt yourself. You know, you hurt yourself because you don't know what the next person might have quoted. So they may have asked for 20% and you're asking for 8%, but there's still a 12% gap you could have gotten if you just stuck to what you believe. So if your number, whatever your number is, stick with it. My number is 15 to 20%. Mm -hmm. Stick with that and let the client tell you if that's can work for them or not. Number two is you may offer better work and service that that client who, I mean, that other contractor who's offering more of a percentage is offering. So the, the, the client may really want to work with you per se, excuse me, the client may really want to work with you per se, but if you come in there and undervalue yourself, they may question why is that? Why is their price so low? I've heard it before. Mm. You know, people say, listen, how much cost to do a kitchen? Uh, one, one guy says, oh, I can do 15,000. Mm -hmm. The other guy says, I'll do for 5,000. People are questioning, why is his price so low? You may lose, you may lose a job like that because you're coming in so low and they're questioning the quality of work that you can give. I love that you bring this up. One thing we noticed in the flipping business and with, I mean, at this point I've helped launch and turn around dozens of contracting contractors and construction companies. And this is, this is the thing. This is the question I ask. This is maybe you can use this or maybe you already do. I always say standardize your scope of work document, standardize it. Mm -hmm. Hey, listen, I'm going to go through based on everything that you tell me when I meet with you as a client, it, here's the scope of work. And then I'm going to give it back with that scope of work, with the price, the timing, and the team. I'm going to know the resources that it's going to take. All I'll ask, just to be fair, because I will be fair, is I'll tell the client. You tell your client, be transparent. Here's the blank version of that scope of work. Have anyone else who's doing an estimate standardize it. And if they're not standardizing it, if they're not going to do that, maybe ask the question, why won't they use my sheet and standardize it? Because if you can't, can't compare apples to apples, right. you're just going to quickly note it down or they say, well, I don't write that stuff down. Here's your price. How could you possibly know what you're going to get? So just be fair. We'll do the best we can. We also are, a, I also tell my, my clients, tell them you're in the business for profit. Like I'm a for-profit, we give back, we love helping out, we want to do a great job, but I pay people really well so we can do a great job for you. Right. So that's, a, that's something uh, that I found works really well and it, it, it speaks to what you're doing. If you don't have apples to apples, you lose that, that $12,000, or I should say not $12,000, 12, $12 um, percent window and you could, you could end up losing all this money and it hurts you. And I think in the end, it also hurts the customer. So yeah. let's, the third question I'm going to have is this, if there's one piece of advice that you could give anyone who's listening right now that I haven't brought up, just something like this is, you know, I got, you, you got a platform where at this point, tens of thousands of people are going to hear this as soon as this goes out. That's awesome, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say when it first goes out, but there'll be hundreds of thousands of people who will see it uh, in, you know, over time. Right anymore but we have a pretty good size network so we want i want to make sure they hear so you're thinking like your wheels have been turning what rises to the top like listen if you get nothing out of this interview get this what is it take a chance on yourself take a chance on yourself figure out what you like to do what makes you happy what makes you thrive and then find ways to make money around it it's that simple i got into real estate i enjoyed being a real estate agent I enjoyed looking at houses. I enjoyed selling houses to where I jumped from there to, okay, you know what? I want to actually design and create a house to sell. I started investing, you know, and they said, you know what? I want to take control and actually help my clients and other people I know fix their houses. 
So I got into the construction game. Mm. And all of it to me, it's fun. Um, I love seeing it, you know, people be happy with the work that we do. I love people see, I love people, see, I love seeing people closing their properties. I love creating my own properties. I love seeing uh, a property when it's run down and needs complete gut jobs and renovation to see it completely done and rehabs, staged and, and renovated properly. So I found a way to make money off of what makes me happy when I enjoy it, all because I believed in myself. So that's the biggest thing is believe in yourself, believe in what you want, and go out there and get it done. You know, we have opportunities every day to go out there and, and, and be great. So why not do it? And that's the biggest thing. No matter what business you're in, um, find a way that you can make yourself money while being happy at the same time. I think that's great advice. I don't think better advice could be given. And you've done a great job with your business. Mike LaVan. <laughs> you got it. LaVan. <laughs> Mike Levan, uh, what you're doing is great. And the advice you're sharing is great. Um, I look forward to seeing what, what you come up with next and hearing more about staying in touch more about where you're going with the construction company and with the investing. So let's make a point that we stay in touch. Um, where can listeners go to learn more about you and connect with you? You know, uh, we have listeners all over the country. So yeah. uh, where do they go to find you? Um, Instagram, P-O-P, H-L-V underscore real estate. Uh, once again, that's Instagram, P-O-P-H-L-V underscore real estate. My website is www.lavan, L-A-V-A-N, got the keys, dot com. So L-A-V-A-N-G-O-T-T-H-E-K-E-Y-S.com. Um, you can also see my contract of business at um, homesbylv.com. So www.homes, H-O-M-E-S, by B-Y, L-V, um, L-L-C.com. So and then Facebook, Michael Levan, the realtor. You can find me on there. But we'll put that in the notes. So I'll put it. I'll put it right down below. I'll put it on the YouTube page and the Facebook page. We'll make That's sure. Perfect. Oh yeah, YouTube, Michael Levan, the realtor. Also, I got some videos up there of before and after renovation. So you can stop in, subscribe, and I appreciate you guys. Yeah, per you get beautiful pictures on the website too. Mike Levan, thanks for being on the Minimal CEO podcast. Uh, I really appreciate you taking. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Again, this is Nate Lindquist with the Minimalist CEO Podcast. Again, we've gotten some great insights from someone who's doing the work, who had the dream, who's, who's got the boots on the ground. If you're wondering what's essential for me, how do I share my gifts? How can I focus on building a helping system? How can I focus on doing what's essential? Well, we just heard a great story how Mike Levan has done that, is doing that, and how we can all learn from everyone else's mistakes in that mistakes laboratory. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for downloading this episode. Please share it. Please ask us questions. Reach out also anytime by finding us on Facebook at, as always, The Minimalist CEO. I'm Nate Lindquist. I appreciate that you're here. And uh, as always, send an email to help at The Minimalist CEO if you have questions for us and our team. And uh, make it happen. Share your gifts. And I'll talk to you soon.